Thank you guys. Appreciate it. It's always good to have the children with us in worship because they get to watch the adults as we worship and model what that looks like. And it's always good to have a children's message because that's the moment the most adults pay attention. So that was good. <laughs> Haven't you noticed that? I've always noticed that. Um, so I get it. And, and I don't have bags to give to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Very sorry. I know. I know. It's tough growing up. Uh, Today, we are, this week, collecting those coats, and so I want to pray uh, just that the Lord would bless those coats as they go out to students in our community, and um, so we'll pray for that, and if you've been watching the news, you see there's a lot going on with Israel right now, and so we're going to pray for the nation of Israel and all of violence that's going on there, and as a matter of fact, uh, we have about 40, over 40 people who have signed up to go to Israel October 18th. So all of that is uh, up in the air. And so we will be paying attention and we'll take direction on uh, what we need to do in the future here. But let's, let's go to the Lord. Let's pray for those coats. Let's pray for the nation of Israel. Fathers, we come before you. We're so thankful that we have an opportunity to give to others. And Lord, as these coats are distributed among children in the school system, we're praying that they would know that they're loved, that this is coming from a group of people who want to love their neighbor. And Lord, we just pray that our love wouldn't stop with coats, but that love would truly push into the place that you call us to go. And that's with the gospel, the good news, that these children would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to show love, to do it in tangible ways. We pray that you bless every student in Jesus' name. Then, Lord, as we think about Israel and what's going on there in that nation, we as a body of Christ, we pray for the peace of Israel. Father, that you would bring an end to the violence. Lord, that you would superintend all that is going on. We thank you for your sovereignty. Nothing escapes your eye. You are well in control. And so, Father, it's our desire that you bring peace, and to bring peace to that nation. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers as we open up your word. We pray that it would be made alive to us that we would grow, that we would continue to be discipled by your word, that we wouldn't just hear your word. We would do your word as you have asked us to. So, Father, we thank you just for the richness of what we get to read. We thank you for your love, for your presence in this room. I pray for all of my friends that are gathered here, that you would minister to their hearts, to their minds, and in their lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I want to welcome you. Uh, welcome those that are probably watching in very warm weather. God bless you. Uh, we wish that we were with you, uh, but we're glad that we have this opportunity to open up God's word. We're going to be in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 20. And as you're turning to Luke, uh, get used to it because come Christmas, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1, and then we're just going to continue on with Luke. So we'll work our way through the book of Luke beginning this December, and uh, we'll, we'll mine it for the richness that it is, and we will see uh, just the good news of Jesus Christ displayed page after page. So today we're going to be in Luke chapter 20. I'll start at verse 46. I just want to set the context. So what's happening here, Jesus is in the temple. It's getting really close to the time that Jesus is going to be going to the cross, dying on the cross for our sins, then rising from the dead to give us life. Now, uh, as he's in the temple, he's teaching. There's, there's all kinds of people there, and he's teaching them, and there's all of these religious leaders that are gathered there as well. Now, the religious leaders are there not because they, they want to learn from Jesus. They're there because they have in mind to ask him a whole bunch of trick questions. They're trying to trip Jesus up. They're trying to find a way to discredit Jesus because they're not interested in him. They're interested in their own power. And so they ask all of these questions. They're trying to trip him up. And Jesus is God and Jesus is smart. And he realizes all the manipulation that these religious leaders are doing. He's not having it. He's not going to roll over and just let somebody steamroll over him. He's going to go ahead and address them. And that's when he says this in Luke chapter 20, verse 46. He looks at those religious leaders and he says, beware of the scribes. Now, the scribes, the scribes, they started out as people who would write the gospel or write the Bible. They'd write it out, and they were transcribing. They were, they were scribes, but they continued to grow in their uh, popularity, in their knowledge among the people, and they were seen on the same kind of level as the Pharisees. They, they were seen as people who were teachers, and they knew the law. 
And they knew the law really, really well. And they saw themselves, and they kind of had a puffed up chest, and they thought highly of themselves. In fact, the rabbis, the Pharisees, the scribes, they would tell people, you need to honor us. You need to honor us more than you honor your own father or your own mother. We're just below God, and so you need to hold us in high esteem. And Jesus wasn't having any of that. So he looks at those people and he says, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. They devour Widows' houses. That word devour can also be translated misappropriate. Misappropriate. What scholars think was going on at the time of Jesus is that these religious leaders would do a funeral for a widow. And they would go to the widow and they would try to convince her to sign over the title of her home to them. And they would say, that is such a God-honoring thing for you to do. And if they were to convince that widow to sign over the title they would then auction off the house. They would then take the proceeds and that's what gave them the money to buy those long flowing robes and to get them courtside seats at the best banquets and feasts. And Jesus sees this and he says, beware of these people who devour widows' houses. Now, look at the next verse. The next verse happens in the next chapter. When the Bible is written down, it wasn't written down with chapter and verse. It just, it just flowed from one sentence to another. So the very next sentence, watch this. Jesus looked up. He's still in the temple. Jesus looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box at the temple. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. Those two copper coins, that's the smallest denomination they had. It's like two pennies. She put in two small copper coins, and he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contribute out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Now, I was thinking, and I'm just speculating, all right? Take this with a grain of salt. I don't know for sure, but what if this widow was one of the widow's whose home was devoured. I don't know for sure, but Jesus just got done making a point of being aware of the scribes, these religious leaders, and what they were doing by devouring widows' homes. And here's a widow. What if they took her money? What what if she made her way to the temple that day with her final two cents, as Jesus said, and it happened because of this kind of manipulation? I mean, think about it, still grieving the death of her husband. She makes her way to the temple with her last two cents. And she's thinking to herself, well, God has taken care of me when all of this terrible stuff has happened with my husband dying and then with my home and the religious leaders. And God has taken care of me today. And I bet my last two cents, God will take care of me tomorrow. And with that, she drops in her final two coins. Now, if that were the case, it it says a lot about this woman and her heart. It says a lot about her ability to have faith in God and his ability to follow through, his trustworthiness to care for her with tomorrow. It says a lot about her ability to forgive if this is the case. It says a lot about her ability to distinguish between the very poor leaders of an institution and the God that they seek to glorify. And so can you see why Jesus would take a time out here in his teaching and point out this woman and what she had done? She's an amazing individual. It's an extraordinary offering that she had given. And then I'm kind of thinking about, okay, maybe there's a correlation between the widow and them being devoured with their homes and this widow dropping off her final two cents. And then I started thinking, what happened next? And we don't read about it, but what happens when she goes home? What happens the next day? What happens when the flower runs out in the cupboard? I'm pretty sure that Jesus didn't end up saying this and be like, you know, she dropped in her final two cents. That wasn't real smart. She should have invested it. 
she should have bought more food. No, he's elevating the fact that she has taken everything sacrificially and given it to God and knowing the heart of God and his desire for orphans and widows, something happened with that woman. I don't know whether it was that day or the next day, but she's got a story to tell. I don't know if it was a knock on the door and Jesus himself or someone he has sent, but he took care of her because that's our Lord. He's trustworthy. This is what he does. And, and I say that because in Luke chapter 12, Jesus says this. He says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten by God. You're of far more worth than many sparrows. His eyes on the sparrow, his eyes on you, he's taking care of you. And this woman, this widow, knew that her God is trustworthy. Now, the only thing that Jesus says about the other larger donors is that they gave out of their abundance. He doesn't say that's bad. That's not bad. It's, it's a good thing. But it didn't require the same kind of trust. It didn't require the same kind of prayers in a trustworthy God as this widow has displayed in this moment. Now, just a few observations as I think about this. One, one would be this, and I think we can all agree with this one. Devouring widow's property is an unthinkable offense. I, I think we could all come to that place. Like there is a special place for people who devour widows' homes, who take advantage of widows. I was talking to somebody just this week. They had no idea that I was preaching on this. And they were telling me about a family member that a large corporation had just taken advantage of their widow family member. Thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. Credit union made it right. And I think about how many times I've heard of other, other business people and repairmen, other people taking advantage of elderly widows. I mean, it's one thing if it happens to me, and it's happened to me, I'm sure it's happened to some of you, like I can recover from that kind of thing. I have a job, but this is a widow. And so the, the thing that kind of comes to my mind is it should be the job of every Christian to make sure that kind of thing isn't happening to widows, that we would do what God's word says and we would take up the cause of the fatherless and widows. This is what it says in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter one, verse 16. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. All throughout scripture, God has a special place in his heart for the fatherless, for, for widows, for orphans. In fact, in November, November 10th, uh, that Sunday set aside as Orphan Sunday. They call it Stand Sunday now. And so we're just gonna highlight some of the ways in, in which people in our church family are adopting and fostering and helping foster families as we're living out what God's word is telling us, what Jesus displays here, right? It, it, it's, it's our love and the love that we show because of what Christ has done in our lives. And so we want to make sure that people aren't devouring widows' properties. We have a responsibility as a church even to care for widows, to make sure that we're paying attention and we're caring for them, we're loving them, protecting them. Now, the other observation that I'm making here is that Jesus notices offerings. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Jesus noticed offerings then, and he notices offerings today. Jesus is alive, and he sees everything. He knows everything. And Jesus observes what we give. And every church takes up an offering differently. And as I preach about money, every now and then, I'm like, I think some people are like, why did we not go on vacation for fall break, right? So... You know, we're talking about offering. I'm not trying to guilt you or anything. I'm just saying every church does it a little bit differently. And we're really low key around here. Like the way that we give money around here is we drop off money in the wall of mystery. All right. Some people that are here for months are like, how do you give money around here? I don't, I don't know how this works. Uh, we also do it online, which is another mystery. How does that work? I don't know. But every church does it differently. I grew up in a church, like some of you, where we had an offering plate. And you pass the offering plate every, every Sunday. And those plates are all kinds of different plates. You got wood plates. You got metal plates. You got bags. Uh, you got buckets. I think the oddest offering uh, one time, uh, a bucket came. It was a KFC bucket. I just, I just felt... 
It felt funny. That didn't seem right. So I put my chicken in it. I'm kidding. I, I didn't have any chicken. Uh, I remember like in the church, one of the churches I was in, they had the metal plates. And if you don't have the felt on the, even if you have the felt on the mod, bottom of that plate, it is loud. When change goes in, everybody knows. Like, I don't know. We're going to be able to pay the light bill this week. I don't know, right? And then I would watch. Now, you don't have to confess if you watch the offering as it came by, but I, I would look. And uh, every now and then, um, I just felt kind of bad for looking in the offering plate. And then I realized, well, Jesus here at the temple, he was looking at what people gave. And I think, well, what would Jesus do? Well, he'd just watch, right? He, he looked, there wasn't, wasn't a problem. And he's still watching. It's not as if we're hiding from him. It's not as if he has no idea what we're giving or not giving. He knows, he sees, he notices. And this leads me to my next point. Not the amount but the heart. He wasn't concerned about the amount. He's not concerned about your amount. He's concerned about your heart. He not only knew who was giving what, he knew why they were giving what. And it's the why. It's the why that matters most. The widow who gave those two copper coins, man, that impacted Jesus more than the biggest offerings that were dropped in that offering box. He knew the work that had to go on inside of that woman's heart as she took every step to temple that day, knowing that this is her last two cents. And she's going to entrust that back to God, trusting that he'll take care of her the next day. He, he knows the inner work on the inside of me when it comes to returning to God an offering. All of the struggle that goes on on the inside all of the drama and difficult. He's not interested necessarily in the amount. He's looking at my heart. He's looking at your heart. Do we consider him to be trustworthy? Will he take care of us? Can we trust the one who has entrusted us with so much? It's our attitude in giving. And we push back and it's difficult to hear this kind of thing talked about because you think people are just after your money. Not after your money. The thing that God wants is your heart. And we think that, you know, God can't see what we're giving. He knows what we're giving, no matter how tightly you wad that bill up and drop it in the offering plate. He, he knows what we're giving. We think, well, God can't get his hands on this. It's mine. I've protected this money. I've got it at the bank. I've put it in a trust. My money's safe here. Look, if God wanted your money, he could take it. It's not as if you have found a way that God can't get to your money. For any of us, do we think that our money is so safe and so secure in a stock market or in a bank that God couldn't get to every last dime in a moment? It's all his. And in any moment he wanted it, he could take it. But he's not after the money, friend. Is after your heart. And your heart and your money, man, they are so linked and so tied together. And God wants your heart. And there are some gifts that make God sick, even big gifts. And there are some gifts that are so small that we think it wouldn't matter, but they bless his heart. And nowhere is this clearer where we see how certain gifts make God sick than in the Old Testament, particularly, particularly in the book of Malachi. In the book of Malachi, he just kind of unloads on people. In, in, in Malachi and throughout the Old Testament, we learn what God's looking for. God says, I want you to come and bring, in particular, I want you to bring a lamb. I want you to bring a spotless lamb. Go through your herds of animals, go find your lamb, find the very best lamb, and then bring it to my courtyard and then offer it to me as an offering. That's all I want. And some people did that. They would go through their herd and they'd look through their little lambs and they would find the best lamb, spotless lamb. I'm taking this one. This one's God's. This is what he's asked for. Other people did it a little bit differently. Some people went through the herds and they were thinking, you know, I don't really want to give the best. I don't want to give the best lamb. I want the best lamb to go to market tomorrow. So I want to find the one that's not quite as good as that one. So they walk through the herd, and then they find one that's not as good as that one. 
and not as good as that one and not as good as that one until finally they find one kind of leaning up against a fence post, sick, half dead. Looks like it went through a couple rounds with Mike Tyson, right? So they scoop up this lamb and march into the courtyard with this half dead lamb to give to God. And maybe in their mind, they're thinking, well, a lamb is better than no lamb. A lamb that is blemished is better than no lamb, God. And that is when God speaks to these people through Malachi with some of the harshest words that he's given. We find this in Malachi chapter one, verse six. God says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where's my honor? And if I'm a master, where's my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, well, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he show favor? Will he show favor to many of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. I will not accept an offering from your hand. So God says, shut the temple gates, put out the fires. This is ridiculous. I ask for one thing. I just ask for a spotless lamb and you don't want to give it. All I want from people who are called by my name, who say that they love me, is their best offering. And many of us in this room, we have had our lives like radically transformed by God's best gift. His son, Jesus Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God given in our place. God not holding back his love, not withholding from us, but lavishing us with his love by sending his son, Jesus Christ, perfect, sinless, to take on all of our sin, all of our junk, all of the wrath that was due us. And he would take all of that on the cross, willingly, gladly. Why? Love. Love gives. Love doesn't withhold. What do we love? And when we've been changed from the inside out, by a God who just so graciously would give us forgiveness and cleanse us, washing us, making us new, and then offering us heaven and the riches of heaven. I'm telling you, friend, as a believer that does something on the inside of your heart, and then you return to God. This is discipleship because that's obedience. It's not obedience out of guilt. It's not obedience out of fear of God. It's obedience out of the love of God that's been poured into our hearts. And there's just something on the inside of us that wants to give God our best, the best of our abilities, the best of our talents, the very best of our resources, the very best of our worship, because that is what he gave us. And out of gratitude, we want to give it right back. There's all kinds of different ways. The kids were up here and you heard in the children's message different ways that we can give to God. We can give our time, we can give of our talents, we can give of our resources. Now I know what we often think about, we just you know, kind of quickly go to, to giving financially. And there's all kinds of different ways that we give to God financially. I'll mention three. One is tithing. Another is spontaneous spirit-prompted giving. And then the other would be sacrificial giving. The first, tithing, if you hear about that in church or you read about it in the Bible, tithing is taking the first 10% and returning that to God. You're saying, God, you're first. You gave of me. You gave to me your very best. 
And so out of a heart of love and gratitude, I'm going to return. And you're first before Uncle Sam gets paid, before I get paid, uh, before any bills get paid, you get, you get first. And we take as a, a first fruit offering and we return to God immediately. And we say, this is yours. This is what he was talking about in, in Malachi chapter 3. We pick up there again in verse 8. God says this to the nation of Israel. He says, will a man rob God? And you think, well, how can somebody rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? Well, in your tithes and contributions. You're cursed with a curse. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test. The only time God says, test me right here, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. And so when you hear people talking about tithing, nobody's looking for merit badges. We're, nobody's looking to be applauded. We're not looking for, for some way to manipulate God. Out of a heart of love, we're saying, God, you're first. And I'm going to return a portion of what's already yours. It's all yours. And so I'm returning this to you. You've placed it in my hands. I'll put it in yours. Now, the second kind of giving. The second kind of giving is spirit-prompted giving. So th this is beyond the tithe. This is something different. The, the spirit-prompted giving is when, when the spirit kind of tugs at your heart and, and you see a need or you see an issue, you see a problem, you see a person, you're just like, I know I've got to do something. God's given me the resources to do it, and I want to bless somebody else. And I've seen this happen in our church family so often. In fact, I, I've, been, I've been a Christian for, or in Christian world now, all my life. And this is one of the most generous churches I've ever seen. Not because of what is like an offering, but what happens outside of that. That I get like a first row seat sometimes to hear and be like, what? What just happened? I mean, there's been, I can't tell you how many times there's been somebody like a, a single mom who needs a car and somebody gives her a car. Not like give the church to give her a car. They're like, there's a single mom who has a need. She needs a car. I've got three. I can only drive one at a time. Have this one. And she's just blessed. I've seen men go over to widows' homes and take care of all kinds of issues and take care of things, making sure that everything's where it needs to be and fixed up. I, there, I, it was like a couple months ago. We had some guy just passing through here. It was Sunday morning. He saw the church was open, wanted a hot cup of coffee. He came in. Somebody started talking to him out in the cafe, found out this guy, he's just walking home, and it's like states away, I think out east. I'm not sure. And he's, he's just walking home. And so the guy talking to him just felt this spirit prompting and bought him a bus ticket. Nobody made him do it. He's just like, I think God wants him to have a bus ticket. So he bought it. Those moments are so rich. They're so joyful. I mean, even just to sit on the other side of it and then watch what God does. But when you're the one and God is using you and you're like, oh, I think God's telling me to do this. And then you do it and then you find out, well, how did you know? I needed that exact amount. I needed that exact item. And you're like, God used me. It's just such a joyful thing. See, so often people think about giving money and they're like, oh, that must be miserable. The pastor wouldn't want to talk about it. No, I want to talk about it. I want to tell you how richly God has blessed me, how richly God has blessed others. Not because we thought, well, let me look for the worst lamb that I can find, but how can I give God my very best and then watch what only God can do? It's a joy. It's a trip. Like it's a journey of adventure of being able to say, God, these are your resources. I'm just managing it. I'm going to leave it all anyway. How can I use it now to bless your kingdom, to bless your name? And then finally, the last kind of way we talked about is the sacrificial giving. Again, the children's message, they, they talked about uh, what, what would you happily give away uh, and then what would you not want to give away. That would be a sacrifice, right? And sometimes God may ask you to sacrifice like an item to give something up. When I first came back to the Lord, dedicated my life fully to him, surrendered to him, the thing that was God in my life before him was golfing. I would just golf all the time. And I knew for me, that was idolatry. 
So I had to give my golf clubs away and quit. So I quit for a period of time. I was talking to somebody else not long ago. They had a hobby that they enjoyed, but it was consuming. It took the wrong place in their life. And so they had to just give it all away. There's that thing on the inside where you begin to sacrifice. And then God opens up your heart once again to true blessings. And every now and then, there are unique circumstances where God asks some people to cash out. Totally, if not virtually, cash out like this widow. Now that's rare. And I want, I want you to know that that's something you would have to truly, truly, truly pray about and make sure that that is God speaking, but you'll know when it is. And if you've ever taken that step of faith, like this woman, and God has asked you to sacrifice unlike any other, if you've done that, then you've got a story to tell. You got a story to tell about how God met your needs and he provided for you. And you found out that God is trustworthy. When Jesus is making his way into the temple that day and he's watching what people give, he wasn't looking at the amount. He's looking right at the heart. He's looking at all that internal kind of struggle that happens on the inside of us where we can prop ourselves up and make sure we've got enough resources because we don't trust God to come through. He's looking at all those things in our heart that might entangle us and snare us. He's looking right at the heart. And it's my dream that here at BRCC, we'll have more and more people who, who begin to have a joy and a freedom in giving, not out of guilt, not out of manipulation, not out of fear of God, but just simply because they understand that everything has come from God and he has entrusted it into our hands so that we might then entrust it into the hands of the one who is trustworthy. And God will take care of us. Let's pray. Father, my heart can get easily tangled up in stuff, in money, finding security in what might be in the bank account. Would you break that in me? Would you break that in us? Would you help us, Lord, in this area of giving, of finances? Would you free us up from all of that? Would you remind us of your great sacrifice, your willingness to give freely to us by sending your son, Jesus Christ, out of a heart of gratitude, not manipulation, not guilt, not legalism, to return to you, to trust you. And then, Lord, as we do that together, would you allow that to make an impact right here in this church family and outside of these walls and even outside of this state or country so that the kingdom of God would continue to expand. Help us to 